Hakeem Adeniji making a surprise return and crossing over with the Ravens. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Today, we cross over with Kevin Ostriker from the Locked On Ravens podcast. That's coming your way in segments two and three. Get a feel for how things are going for the five and one Baltimore Ravens. But before we get there, let's start with the most surprising news of the day, James, which is Hakeem Adeniji apparently has been cleared to practice. And I believe that means he has three weeks to either be activated or go to season ending IR. He's coming off the non-football injury list. Uh, His injury occurred away from the facility, a torn pec that we all assumed meant that he was done for the entire year. Mm -hmm. And it turns out he's instead been cleared to practice. Yeah, this is potentially huge depending on how big you you look at it. But like, there's not a lot of depth at either tackle spot in, Akeem Adeniji is certainly someone that you were hoping would take a step forward. And so he's not going to be active on Sunday against the Ravens because let's be honest here. Wednesday was his first practice with Frank Pollock. It's crazy to think about, but it is. I mean, he <clears throat> he went through OTAs and stuff, I believe, you know, the offseason stuff. But he tore his pec in, I think it was early June. So he, he's been out of it. And so hopefully now – he can get his legs under him, start to get in football shape. And maybe two weeks from now, he can be active. And maybe he is back for that week nine matchup against the Cleveland Browns. And you can bolster the offensive line a bit. And the, the other thing here is, I know there's a lot of concern about the interior of the offensive line. Who knows? Maybe Akeem Adeniji will take reps there too and, and show some potential. So I, I think it is uh, exciting that he's potentially – going to be able to play this year and and get back on the field at some point this season. Here's my like somewhat conspiratorial reason to be excited is that the the coaches have hyped up a few players or hyped up to us or to the media, a few players this off season. Hakeem Adeniji was one of them, like supposedly Mm -hmm. took this big step in the off season. That was also said of Logan Wilson. It was also said of like Cheeto having great practices. And those guys on the defensive side of the ball have been really good. And so if that's also true for Hakeem Adeniji and the coaches are just telling us blatantly the truth, these guys actually are good. Well, maybe Hakeem Adeniji is actually going to be a big shot in the arm, right? And I, I do think that the primary plan for Adeniji might be the interior because mm-hmm. Isaiah Prince, I think they're pretty pleased with how he's playing uh, as an extra tackle. He's clearly over Fred Johnson at this point. But Mm -hmm. there's no one else on the interior without Deontay uh, Deontay Smith. And so if you get Adeniji back, he's worked at all these positions before last year with uh, Jim Turner. Jim Turner said he was even going to get him snapping the ball at some point, as Matt Minnick pointed out on Twitter today. Uh, I don't know that he'll necessarily be working at center, but there's no backup guards right now. I mean, it's Trey Hill, right? And so they probably want to make sure they have a backup center and a backup card. And and it's not necessarily just Fred Johnson. So it'll be interesting to see where he actually gets his work and, and how that goes. And we'll see how that shakes out. I'm excited for Hakeem's return. And it's great that we see a pec injury, not keep him out for a whole year. It's not an entire lost year, which is a big deal for a guy that was a developmental prospect with some tools. Uh, The other guy coming off of an injured list before we get to the guys on the 53 man roster on the injury report is Khaled Kareem. And you guys talked with Zach Taylor about that in the press conference today. Yeah. So he's not going to be active on Sunday. And I think that's okay because you don't want to rush him back. And much like Akeem Adeniji, it's, it's good to get a look at them and, and have this window where you can get them back into football shape. So he practiced three times last week going to practice three times this week, not going to play on Sunday, but hopefully you get him back in time for that Jets game and you can get him going. Now, that being said, that's two areas, right? Interior or or just offensive line in general, but specifically interior potentially, if if you're right about identity and them using him on the interior, which I totally see the path to. And Khaled Kareem, edge rusher. 
I think it's beautiful that they're able to, and I'm serious, quote me, beautiful that they're able to get a look at both of these guys now because the trade deadline is November 2nd. And getting those guys back, if they can end up contributing at those spots, it can be a little bit of a shot in the arm. That doesn't mean you don't go make a trade, but if they're not ready, if a week from now it's like, yeah, Akeem, he's just not going to be ready to go, and and we got to shut him down and put him on season-ending IR, or same thing with Khalid Kareem, then you know, and, and you can move on. And it's not like, oh, well, maybe we'll get him back November 10th, a week after the deadline. So there is some advantage to them getting healthy when they are, even if it doesn't work out that way, you have an idea of what you're rolling with into that November 2nd deadline. And we'll quickly run through the rest of the injuries because I agree with you. It's, it's a good idea to, to have a feel, a better idea of where your roster's at. The injuries for the guys currently on the 53-man roster, three players did not practice with various injuries. Jalen Davis apparently has an ankle injury. Trey Hopkins got his customary Wednesday off as he's listed with a knee injury. Josh Tupo a little bit concerningly didn't practice with a knee injury. So we'll see what goes on with those guys. Always watching Trey Hopkins status. Limited participants. Ricardo Allen has an ankle injury. Jackson Carmen got a day off for rest after he uh, vomited on the football field. Chris Evans has a hamstring injury, apparently. Really important to watch that. He was on the rehab field on uh, Wednesday and is currently the only backup on the 53-man roster to Joe Mixon. Clark Harris has a knee injury. He was limited on Wednesday. Hopefully nothing serious there. And Trey Hendrickson has a shoulder injury, but he was making his national media appearances. So I'm going to knock on wood and hope that that one also isn't serious. Joe Burrow still listed on the injury report with his throat injury. What'd you say? <laughs> I can't he hear didn't, you. He didn't, uh, he, he didn't talk to the media, uh, you know, oddly enough, but uh, you know, Joe's fine. He's going to play. It's uh I wouldn't want to see me in person if I, you know, if I could avoid it too. That's why you're still all the way in Canada, Jake. You don't have to deal with me daily in person. That that is the only reason, in fact, it. that I That's remain right. in Canada. A quick look at the Ravens injury report. Bradley Bozeman didn't practice with a back injury, the Ravens starting center. Latavius Murray didn't practice with an ankle injury. Doesn't really matter. They have infinity running backs. Alejandro Villanueva, their left tackle right now, didn't practice with a knee injury. Worth watching that one. Sammy Watkins might miss this game. He has a thigh injury. And Tavon Young didn't practice with a knee injury. So we'll keep an eye on those as the week goes on. And before we get to the crossover, James, how about some inflammatory remarks from Mike Hilton in his press conference on Wednesday? Extend Jesse Bates. <laughs> what a great quote. How about that? How about that? So the news conference is over. Over. And it was last question someone answered, and that's it. No one's asking Mike Hilton anything else. And this dude just... <laughs> Extend Jesse Bates. <laughs> and yells, put that out there. You don't think those players talk about it? Man, oh man. That's uh extend Jesse Bates. What do you think? I I think uh this continues to be like a bit of a PR mess for the Bengals. I don't know how much they care. I don't know how much it impacts anything, but uh it shows some camaraderie in that locker room. It shows that you're right, they're talking about it, and uh we'll see if it matters. I, I would like to see it get done. I think we'd all like to see it get done. I, I agree with Mike Hilton. Extend Jesse Bates. Yeah, it's uh, – wow. How awkward is uh, – again, no one asked him. It's not like I was like, oh, do you think this Bengals defense is better with Jesse Bates, you know, and, and giving him the bait. He was he went out there like, this is what I'm going to say. And, and he decided he picked his moment, and it was uh, it was great. By the way, if you're listening, I'm sure it, you can you can feel it. But this is why you should – subscribe to the podcast on YouTube because you get to see Mike Hilton's reaction, the face he makes, his body language, certainly uh, certainly worth uh, checking out. But uh, as Jake mentioned, it's crossover Thursday. So let's get the latest on the Ravens from Kevin Ostriker. He'll join us next. But first, a word from Rock Otto. And look, I'm driving the day, woo. All the way to Baltimore, ladies and gentlemen. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to make it there without pushing it to Sunday's game? Well, it's with Rock Auto. 
and rockauto.com. And they're a family owned business. They've been working and helping drivers like me, drivers of Daewoo's like me for more than two decades. So why spend more on auto parts, 30, 50, 100% more, whether it's a dealer or a, a car place that's going to say, oh yeah, we're going to charge you hundreds of bucks for a cabin filter, cabin air filter. No, no, no. That's, that's much cheaper. Or maybe you need something more complex. It's a fuel pump. It doesn't matter the job. It doesn't matter the make or model of your vehicle. They're going to have it at rockauto.com. So go there now, see all the parts available for your car, truck, and be sure to write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. And we are with our crossover here, Locked on Ravens, Locked on Bengals. Kevin Ostrecker of Locked on Ravens here with Jake Liskow and James Rapine of Locked on Bengals. And we're talking about the first versus second place matchup in the AFC North here in week seven, the Ravens coming in at five and one, the Bengals coming in at four and two. No, it's not the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Cincinnati off to a phenomenal start this year. So we're going to start off this segment talking about the Ravens offense going up against the Cincinnati defense, which honestly, guys, has impressed me. I didn't know how these new pieces would fit in. They added a lot, a lot of veterans to this defense. But obviously with the task of stopping Lamar Jackson, the the Ravens' very potent, not only run offense, but also passing offense. What's the mood like in Cincinnati right now in terms of how this defense is trying to focus on stopping such a dynamic player in Lamar Jackson? I think that's the exciting challenge of, of week seven here. And, and that's where the conversation really starts, right? It's Lamar Jackson. It's not, you know, J.K. Dobbins taking a second-year leap. He's obviously hurt, but the Ravens running game has continued unabated. The Ravens as a team seem to have continued unabated despite a rash of injuries. So let's start with that matchup. Obviously, Lamar Jackson kills you off script, scrambling. The the Ravens running a lot of gap scheme stuff this year. How how do you see this matchup working with a revamped offensive line? Is is Ben Power still going to be missing? Obviously, like Villanueva maybe stepping in a left tackle. How's Kevin Zeitler fitting? And how do you see the, those guys going against a guy like DJ Reader and and that matchup in the non Lamar Jackson run game, which you know is obviously built around Lamar Jackson, but has still been very successful for the Ravens this year. Yeah, the Ravens run game this year has actually been, you know, you mentioned J.K. Dobbins and obviously Gus Edwards, who both were lost for the year. With their injuries, they've been working with guys like Latavius Murray and Le'Veon Bell, Devonta Freeman, veteran backs. And this wasn't like the Ravens lost Dobbins and Edwards a month or two before the regular season. And they had the time to work in the preseason. They lost these guys like 10 days before the season started. So they were trying to figure out how to incorporate these guys in. So the running backs as a whole haven't been as impressive this year. The offensive line you mentioned, Ronnie Stanley a couple of days ago just announced, you know, he's going to be done for the year. He only played in one game. So Villanueva is stepping in at left tackle, but he's been dealing with a knee injury himself. So with Bradley Bozeman also dealing with a back injury, their starting center, Ben Powers will be there at left guard. Kevin Zeitler's looked the part. He's Kevin Zeitler. He's, he's been a steady veteran for his entire career. And then on the right side, Patrick McCary, who's been great. Going up against the Bengals defensive line, you, know, you mentioned DJ Reader. I think Trey Hendrickson has played well this season. They have a bunch of pieces on the defense. So I think a big key to this is the Ravens run game starting off fast. Against Indianapolis in week five, for example, they averaged just 3.4 yards per carry on the ground against the Los Angeles Chargers. And to be fair, that's a decently bad run defense. They averaged 4.9 yards per carry. So I'm interested not just in the run game, but also this pass game has been improved for Lamar Jackson and just his ability to throw the football. He's taken that leap. And so in the back end for Cincinnati, you know, obviously Jesse Bates is there, one of the best saviors in the NFL. Jadobia Wouzier has looked great this year. With Marquise Brown and Rashad Bateman, there might not be Sammy Watkins in this one. Do you see the Cincinnati defense matching up well with this Ravens passing offense, or do you think that some of the speed could be a challenge? No, I, I think it is a good matchup. The Bengals have faced you know some good receivers um, this year so far. You, you think about the, the Vikings, what they present. And, and then a couple weeks ago, it was Devontae Adams and, and Aaron Rodgers and having to deal with that. So uh, I think the one area – would be, yeah, the secondary should feel confident that they can contain Hollywood Brown, even though he's played pretty well this year. Rashad Bateman's such a, almost a wild card. You don't know what to expect because we haven't seen much of him this year. Obviously, he came back last week. But the one guy 
that is scariest not named Lamar Jackson for this Bengals defense is Mark Andrews in, in how they contain him because he crushed Von Bell last year in this first matchup. And, and that was certainly uh, something that was on Von Bell's mind this off season. It feels like the Bengals have gotten better uh, at, at guarding tight ends, but uh, Mark Andrews is, you know, are arguably their number one option in, in that passing game. So how do they handle it? Uh, in, in the, the thing that I've noticed with Ke- uh, Kevin with, with Lamar this year, it seems like he's you know, scrambling just like he always does and has, but he's still looking downfield and he's making big plays downfield. And so that's the part that will be a challenge for this secondary sticking with Hollywood Brown, not just for three seconds, but for four and a half seconds while Lamar runs away from Trey Hendrickson and company in the backfield. Yeah, that, that's one of the great things about Lamar Jackson. And, and there are many, but the time he creates with the football and the, the difference with him as opposed to maybe some other scrambling-ish quarterbacks is the fact that he's a threat if the defense has everything covered perfectly, everything is set. If Lamar Jackson is not accounted for, he can burn a defense for 20, 30 yards on a play where a defense really does everything right. So with Jackson and his scrambles this year, it honestly feels like he's doing it less. And you mentioned to James kind of focusing, not only just throwing the football a bit more, but throwing it down the field. His deep ball accuracy has improved this year. It's not perfect. You know, he still has missed some throws, but he has definitely improved in that area. In that leap I was talking about, a lot of people were expecting him to take it. I'm sure the narratives you guys have heard them about off oh, this Ravens team is down. They can't come back with Lamar Jackson throwing the football. And, you know, if you stop the Ravens run game, that can't happen. Well, that's not been the case. Teams have been keying in on the Ravens run game and stopping it. And Lamar Jackson has said, all right, I'm going to do it myself with my arm. And that's been a really key part of this offense. But the, both the Ravens and the Bengals in the 2020 draft did a little bit of drafting at the linebacker position. And I know for Cincinnati, both Logan Wilson and Akeem Davis Gaither have been really big parts of this Bengals defense. Now, let me let me put on the record, Logan Wilson's comment was a compliment. First of all, I just want to put that out there. No, no speculation from me about that. It was it was a compliment. But I think Wilson's played really well this year. And, and his growth has been a big part of how this Bengals defense has stepped up to the plate this year. So what do you expect the keys for these linebackers to be going up against this Ravens offense? Well, they need to play disciplined and all three might be on the field together for really the first time in an extended game this year. Because the, the Ravens, I assume, are, are going to be in you know 12 personnel for most of the game is that true so let's start there but before i answer your question too much are the ravens going to be two tight ends for a lot of the game or, or tight end and fullback for a lot of the game early on i think that could be what you see the ravens are trying to work in more pass happy formations in there but i think you know with eric tomlinson who's been replacing nick boyle in their two tight end sets this year he's pretty much boil light and he's been playing really well. So it's pretty much like having an extra offensive lineman on the field. I do think that they will be in 12 personnel, but we'll see how the game and that game script is really important for it too. And, and they love Patrick Ricard as well. I know at fullback. So, I, I mean, I think that that combination, you know, you'll see the Bengals stay in a four, three, maybe a little bit more. We, we talked about this yesterday with our, our film, uh, film guy, our regular film guy, Mike Santagata, Bengal Sands and the Ravens, are one of the only teams that'll get the Bengals out of their kind of five, two front and, and into the four, three, where they'll put an extra linebacker on the field at times to, to deal with Lamar Jackson. It'll be interesting to see if that continues this year, or if they go with, you know, last year, perhaps they did it because of personnel. They're starting interior defensive linemen off the street this year, DJ Reader healthy, Larry Ogunjobi comes from the Browns playing well at three tech. Josh Tupo didn't practice today, but of course, Everybody knows tackled Lamar Jackson in the open field at 300 plus pounds once. So that's pretty good. BJ Hill, the Bengals acquired for Billy Price, and he's been really good. So with those guys, maybe they do do more the the five, two stuff in the defensive front and, and ask Sam Hubbard to be the, the contained guy and Trey Hendrickson, while he's been a good pass rusher, he's made two tackles this year that aren't sacks. Uh, the, the tackle radius issues have come up at times for him. He's, he's got a little bit short arms going on. And so while he's a really good athlete, he hasn't been as good against the run. And so that I think is a challenge for the front seven in general. And against this team, always it's, it's discipline, right? If you get out of your gap in the run game against the Ravens, they seem to know how to punish it frequently. The, the good news for the Bengals is they've been really good in that area this year. Whereas Ravens fans might be used to a Bengals team that is giving up and, and you've the Ravens have run all over the Bengals for years. 
given up the run this year, it, it truly does look like it's a, a transformed unit as far as run defense goes. And a lot of that starts with DJ reader and the defensive line, keeping the linebackers free and the linebackers then using their athleticism, which the Bengals haven't had at that position for quite some time to clean it up. So I'm excited to see that matchup. That's something that's gone the Ravens favor in the Ravens way for, you know, the last two, three years, maybe a little bit longer. And this year, maybe the Bengals have the guys to stick with it. Uh, and on the other side of the ball, it's it's going to be interesting to see if this is a, a low scoring affair, two defenses that are playing pretty well. So we'll talk about the Bengals offense and how they match up with the Ravens defense coming up next. Hey, whether you're a Ravens fan or a Bengals fan, you should get to betonline.ag to wager on the game right now. The Ravens favored in this one, according to Bet Online. So maybe you think Joe Burrow and the Bengals are going to pull off the upset, or maybe you think Lamar Jackson's going to improve to 6-0 and against the Bengals as a starter. Either way, Bet Online is the place to go. And you can check out their new updated desktop or their mobile website, which is new and improved as well. And you can sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with promo code locked on. And it is, it isn't just NFL. They got your college football. They got your NBA. You got your major league baseball playoffs and so much more in one spot, betonline.ag. So use promo code locked on to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. All right. So I just talked a lot about what the Bengals defensive front has done differently this year and how that might be a little bit different. So I'm not going to talk so much this time, but looking at the Ravens defense, they're obviously dealing with injuries on this side of the ball as well, but you still got Chuck Clark. You still got Marlon Humphrey, Calias Campbell's playing great. And Josh Bynes revenge game, as you guys discussed uh, in the pre-show is this Ravens defense uh, a sum greater than its parts. Would you say? Or, or what's keeping them together? What's keeping them cohesive? Yeah, well, he, one of the guys you mentioned in Chuck Clark, I think, has been really, really key for them. He's playing. He's having a career year this year. He's playing great football. He wears the green dot for them on that defense. And I think a lot of people, the perception on Chuck Clark coming into this year was he was just kind of an average safety, didn't really do a ton well, was okay in coverage, was okay in the run game coming up. But he plays so many different roles for them. ESPN put up a graphic during the week five Monday night game where the Ravens played the Colts and he's played almost everywhere on that defense. He comes up and plays a really nice dime linebacker. He can play at the free safety spot, strong safety spot. He's really a do it all type of guy. He's improved in coverage phenomenally. And his counterpart there in Deshaun Elliott has also played great football. The Ravens have a ton of decisions to make with free agency this year, just with how great their 2018 draft class was. One of those players, also Anthony Averett, who's filling in for Marcus Peters, who went down for the year with a torn ACL. He had a really bad game in week five. But other than that, he's played really good football. So they have a bunch of guys who believe in each other. You mentioned Clayus Campbell last week against the Chargers. He literally threw a Chargers offensive lineman across the formation. He's playing all world levels right now. The video of it's insane if you do want to check it. I think Michael Crawford of Ravens would have put that out there. But he's playing great. The Ravens are missing. I mentioned Peters, Derek Wolf. also. Patrick Queen is a bit banged up in this one. But as a unit, they've struggled against the past. They're now starting to kind of bring that back a bit against the high-powered Chargers offense. They did a really good job. But one of the matchups that I want to look at here are the two former LSU teammates in Joe Burrow and Patrick Queen. Now, Patrick Queen had a great game against the Bengals the first time these two teams matched up and that was the only time Burrow did play against the Ravens and and we'll get into this a bit later but the Ravens defense having seven sacks against Burrow in that offensive line but with <laughs> Joe Burrow he is he has improved I mean it's such a high level this year and he's really showing why not only he was the number one pick but why all of Cincinnati was excited for his return this year the weapons around him are great he's playing great football how is Joe Burrow going to get the better of the Ravens defense in this one if he can do it well, it's all to me, it's going to come down to the pre snap and, and his ability to, to read through the disguises that Wink Martindale is going to put together and those different pressure packages that he's going to put together. And Burrow statistically has been much better against the blitz this year, hasn't been blitzed as much, but I expect him to get blitzed a ton this, uh, this weekend, this Sunday in Baltimore. And, you know, that's something, you know, Kevin 
this Ravens defense, that's what they like to do. They're going to blitz you 40, 45% of the time. They're going to try to disguise it. They're going to try to get after you in different ways. And you see, and we covered it earlier this week with uh, Bengal Sands, like, like Jake said, when we had him on, um, sometimes bro misreads it and, and diagnoses it wrong. And maybe they're on empty and there's a free runner or something like that. And that, is, is going to be such a backbreaker on the road at M&T Bank Stadium because if you get that crowd involved and everything like that and you get in second and third and long, well, good luck. Even if you do read it right, it's going to be a, a long day. So um, I, I think that we're going to see how much Burrow learned from that matchup and how much he's grown pre-snap and as a quarterback mentally uh, as much as anything on Sunday against the Ravens. And, you know, I, I do. I think he's up for the challenge, but that's the part of it that's going to get tested because this offensive line, I don't think it's a world beating offensive line by any stretch, but it's better than it was last year in week five when Burrow and the Bengals laid an egg in Baltimore. Uh, His weapons, I think fit better, right? You know, Jamar Chase is better than what they had in AJ Green last year. T Higgins should be 100% healthy. Same with Joe Mixon had a big game last week. So he should have a, a, his full complement of receivers and CJ Uzama who didn't play in that game last year as well. So I think it's going to come down to the pre-snap and how he's able to diagnose things. Yeah, it's a really good point, James. And this Ravens defense, you mentioned, is how often they blitz. I mean, literally, Don Martindale will send seven, eight guys at the line. One play, he'll send all of them. The next play, he'll drop all but three or four back. So it's about those pre-snap, you know, Burrow pre-snap diagnosis, which I think is going to be huge for him. But, you know, you mentioned the Bengals' offensive line and how they are better this year. And then that's key for them because I think – it couldn't have got a lot worse. I mean, Riley Reeves given them 50 million times the production Bobby Hart would give this team at this point. So overall, how impressed or not have you been with the new pieces on this Bengals offensive line? Because I talked about Reef Jackson. Carmen is there, the Bengals second round pick. Are you happy with how they performed through six weeks? Reef has been a solid performer. They've been comfortable leaving him on, a, on an island much more than they were with Bobby Hart. And I think that's the biggest difference. He's not amazing but he's at least average and when you've watched bobby hart as long as we've watched bobby hart and you've watched bobby hart uh you you know that average is pretty good by comparison uh jackson carmen took a little bit of time to get into the starting lineup and then got covid and then threw up on the field last week uh so you know he, he should probably be starting this week they they were starting rookie trey hill who they drafted in the sixth round to play center against Detroit. He started out the game with back-breaking penalties, came back after Carmen puked on the field and played okay the rest of the way. Still had some miscues, but was, you know, reasonable. Uh, but but Carmen's been up and down, as you would expect for a guy who's making a bit of a, a transition from left tackle to, to right guard. Um, you know, wasn't necessarily a world beater at left tackle, but has great athletic tools, and the technique is still coming along hand placement in particular. And if Kalias Campbell is uh, getting some one-on-ones with Jackson Carmen, I'm very afraid. I'm also very afraid of if Kalias Campbell gets one-on-ones with Trey Hopkins coming off the ACL, just hasn't looked like the guy that he was before. Injuries have really piled up for Hopkins in his career. And so that's a matchup that's very concerning to me is just that right guard center spot. But on the left side, Jonah Williams is everything that the Bengals want him to be. He's an above average left tackle. Quentin Spain looks night and day, like fantastic season, great season at left guard after he was, you know, serviceable last year and also playing all over the place. So uh, that'll be very interesting to me to, to see, you know, Adafe Owe, Justin Houston, uh, Kalias Campbell, Justin Matabike go against this, this remade offensive line. And I'll say this to go back to James's point a lot of the Bengals protection issues have not been because of the offensive line. It's been more like Burrow knows he's got a guy hot and, and then he doesn't feel the hot. He doesn't feel the guy coming and he doesn't make the hot throw that he has to make. And and that was a problem against the lions. He's also, you know, against the lions. We talked about yesterday on our show, he he's staring down a safety the safety's first two steps are up and he throws a dig anyway, right where the safety's breaking and you can't make those mistakes against a team that's a higher quality team than the Ravens, right? And so that's going to be very interesting. And on the other side, it's going to be, is it going to be Marlon Humphrey shadowing Jamar Chase, right? The, the Bengals do present a bit of a trio of weapons that teams have started to double Tyler Boyd at times. T Higgins is 
been kind of hit or miss this season dealing with some injuries. So do the Ravens kind of play a disciplined approach? Do they look at the last couple of weeks and play too high a lot and get away from their blitz happy scheme and, and let Marlon Humphrey go to work? Or what are you expecting from the Ravens defense in this unique matchup with a guy that seems to get loose deep every week? Yeah, part of the Ravens defense is definitely limiting what teams can do deep. So despite the fact that Baltimore is a heavy blitzing defense, I don't know if they'll blitz necessarily as much, but I think they want to try because they had so much success the first time. And I'm not saying Burrow's the same player that he was week five of 2020, but you you want to, I think, at least try to blitz him a lot. Now, whether you go to two high looks, I think you could see it, especially if Chase, if Chase gets Bur- or if Chase burns somebody deep once, I think Baltimore is going to start to play very conservatively and just go like Ben, don't break. Where they're going to take the short stuff and they're going to give up that short stuff. But then once they get into the red zone, as this Nanny gets to maybe the Baltimore 40, 30, then they start to play. Baltimore's defense has been known as a Ben, don't break unit for a little while now, or where they will play off in a lot of situations. They'll let an opponent take what's given to them and limit the opportunities deep for a team because they trust their red zone defense to limit the Bengals or whoever they're playing to three points. And I think that if you can limit a team to a kick on every possession, whether that's a punt or a field goal, that's a good success rate to win a football game. So I do think that the Ravens will blitz, but in terms of who's shadowing who, I wouldn't be shocked if they put Marlon Humphrey on the bigger receiver in T Higgins and then go with Anthony Averett, who is a bit more of a, of a speed corner. I wouldn't say that Humphrey's not fast, but I think, profile wise Higgins and Humphrey match up better and Avert and Chase match up better now I wouldn't be shocked to see Humphrey on Chase the entire game I mean he's playing phenomenal football and let's let's be real he, he's been a huge catalyst out of Cincinnati has been so successful this year so you want to try to limit that as much as you can but I wouldn't be shocked if they go with Avert on Chase and then they try to put Humphrey on Higgins and see how it works out and if it doesn't they can adjust accordingly we'll have to see how that all goes uh, what do you guys think about the spread? Let's let's wrap up there. The Ravens like six point favorites, six and a half point favorites in Baltimore. Are you guys buying that? I know you guys both like to make predictions. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm like I'm right there. I have I've been I've been back and forth with my prediction all week. I, I have the Ravens winning by a touchdown. So like literally, I'm r- almost right on that line. But I think this is a much improved Cincinnati team. I mean, people, we were kind of talking about it, James and I, before the show started. People had this Cincinnati team at like three wins this year. And I'm like, this team is too talented to have three wins this year. You know, the AFC North is a very talented division. I think Cincinnati, Cincinnati's defense is playing great football right now. There are still some issues, but I think the Ravens come out on top just because, you know, literally the Lamar Jackson factor. And if you want to throw Justin Tucker in there too, you can. But at the end of the day, these two teams in divisional matchups in general, they always play really good football games. In the John Harbaugh era, Baltimore's 14 and 12 against Cincinnati. I did not know that. I thought it was more in favor of the Ravens, actually. So these two teams play close games. Now, not recently, but it seems like over these last few weeks, Cincinnati has improved and has shown that they are, you know, vying for a spot in the playoffs so far. So I think I have the Ravens by a touchdown, but it could easily be a bit closer than that. Yeah, I, I think it's you could see the path to it being close. You know, you could see the path to it coming down to a final possession, but I think we're going to know really early on, on Sunday, you know, how does this Bengals offense look? How does Burrow look pre-snap? And then is he getting blitzed and does he respond the right way? Because the difference, because this Bengals offense has gotten off the slow starts all season, but then they flipped a switch I don't think you can do that. There are certain teams I don't think you're going to be able to do that against. On the road against Baltimore, if you put the pressure on your defense to stop Lamar, Lamar is going to apply too much pressure. And it's going to be, you're going to look up and it's going to be 14 to three at halftime or something. And you're going to be in an unfavorable spot. So uh, I I think it's close. I'm going to save my prediction for for Thursday's show, as I always do on Locked on Bengals. But uh, that six points, I I see why people would struggle with that. But again, I don't don't want to tip my, my hand too much. There you go. That is it. That is the first <laughs> Bengals Ravens crossover of the year. We'll see if these teams are in fact as close as they may or may not appear. Uh, until next time, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Locked On Bengals Locked On Ravens podcast. Have a good one.